Hello and welcome to hashtag our doc talk. This is North Bay Healthcare's way to reach out to our community and share information on important health issues. I'm social media and online specialist Robin Miller and our guest today is Dr. Nazia Hassan. She's a gastroenterologist whose subspecialty is interventional endoscopy. She earned her medical degree at George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and she is board certified as a gas in gastroenterology and internal medicine. Thank you and welcome, doctor. Hi, thank you for having me. Appreciate you doing this today. Of course. We're going to be talking about our guts, <laughs> to put it bluntly, <laughs> and, and what's going on there. But I think we should start first by talking a little bit about what is interventional endoscopy and, and what is gastroenterology in general and just kind of give us an overview about what you do and sure, what sure. your job is. Sure. So um, so gastroenterology is um, a really fun um, field where we um, can diagnose and treat anything that happens in the entire gastrointestinal system from the mouth all the way down to the anus. Um, and general gastroenterology really focuses on the diagnosis part. Um, and so we use flexible tube with cameras called an endoscopy um, and we perform procedures through the mouth or from below uh, to diagnose and we can also treat some simple things like um, colon polyps. Now interventional endoscopy um, is where we train an additional year beyond our three years of general gastroenterology fellowship. And we really focus that year on being able to perform very complex procedures. Um, so we used some advanced technology to not only be able to treat uh, and diagnose uh, things in the GI tract, but we also have access to organs outside the GI tract. And we can use ultrasound um, and other techniques to be able to treat and do minimally invasive procedures for, for patients that once perhaps have required surgery. Okay, so what are some of the typical kinds of cases or um, issues that you're dealing with? So yeah, so interventional endoscopy um, it treats a wide variety of disease processes. Um, I'll treat things like complications of reflux disease, like Barrett's esophagus, um, in addition to complications of what we'll talk about today, gallstone disease. Um, and then we also diagnose and treat very early gastrointestinal ca cancers from esophageal, stomach, colon, um, liver, pancreas cancer. Um, so it's a really wide range of things. Okay. And so let's start talking about some of those common things you see. Of course, let's start with the gallbladder. Sure. First of all, explain to me what is the gallbladder and what does it do? Like, why do we have it? Yeah, so good question. So, so I have this um, sort of fun, really good depiction uh, of what the gallbladder is. So, um, is that good? Okay, so the gallbladder is a pear-shaped organ that has a muscular wall um, around it, and it's connected to the liver and the intestines through these small tubes called the bile ducts. And the major role of the, ga the gallbladder is to store and concentrate bile. And bile is a fluid that comes from the liver. It carries the waste products of the liver, and it also carries um, uh, components that help us digest fat in our foods. Okay. And um, what is the purpose of the, uh, I mean, is this, it sort of reminds me of what is the point of the appendix and that sort of thing? Yeah, so the gallbladder is uh, an, an important organ um, in normal functioning folks, but you don't need it. So um, what it does it is it's that it stores and concentrates bile and releases bile when we need it. Um, but removal of the gallbladder is possible because the bile ducts can sort of um, start acquiring those properties of the gallbladder and the bile can just be released from the liver itself. Um, and so that's why we don't really need the gallbladder, but it, it does serve a good function when it's there. So what is a gallstone? So, so that's right. So, so gallstones, <laughs> yeah. So, so the bile goes from the liver into the gallbladder. And what can happen is that there can be concretions of the bile that kind of start becoming stone formations. Um, and those stones can then later on be, become symptomatic. Um, and... 
Those stones can be cholesterol stones or pigment stones. Those are the two major categories of stones. Um, and cholesterol stones are the most, by far the most common in the U.S. Does that have to do with our diet? So yeah, so so the next question would be, you know, what causes these stones? And so a lot of it, um, it can be diet related. Um, so folks who have high concentrations of cholesterol or calcium can be predisposed to stone formation. Um, and being overweight can also be a risk factor to forming stones. Um, we don't know the exact pathology of why stones are formed and how they develop, but we know there are certain folks that are particularly at high risk for stone disease. And like I said, it's for folks that are a little bit overweight, um, women more than men, um, above uh, folks above the age of 40, and then also during times of pregnancy that can promote stone formation as well. Okay. And just for those who are tuning in on Facebook to watch this, if you have questions, this works just like any other Facebook post. You can hit the comment button and type it in. We'll be able to see that and pass that along to the doctor. Um, what are the common symptoms if you're having a problem with your gallbladder? Yeah, so the majority of the time when folks have stones, they will have no symptoms at all. And that's what we call silent disease or silent stones. Um, but if you do start developing symptoms, the most common initial symptom is called biliary colic and um, or gallbladder pain, or sometimes people call it gallbladder attack. And that's a very typical pain that comes on very suddenly most likely after a meal on the right upper side of the abdomen, just where the gallbladder is sitting. Um, and it happens very suddenly and it lasts about 30 minutes to an hour. And it can be um, after a particularly fatty meal that the pain becomes uh, a real big issue. Um, yeah. Okay. And so how do you know when it's time to go and see a specialist like you? I mean, do most of these people end up in an emergency room and they call you in? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, so there's a couple of things that can happen. So folks can just have, so you can have silent disease, you can have gallstone pain or biliary colic, um, or you can start developing complications of gallbladder disease. Um, and I'd like to go over three particular complications that we see very often. Okay. Um, so one is so if you start having symptoms of gall, uh, gallbladder disease and they become more and more frequent and you don't end up getting medical attention, um, the gallbladder can become very inflamed on the outside. And that usually happens when there's complete obstruction of a stone um, right at where the gallbladder um, connects to the bile duct, and that we call acute cholecystitis. Is that sort of like being backed up and swelling kind That's of That's right, like yeah, and um, the gallbladder can then become inflamed and then there's a risk of that gallbladder rupturing. Um, so that's a medical emergency that requires hospitalization, IV antibiotics, and eventually gallbladder removal, but that's one of the major complications. Um, and that generally is treated by a general surgeon. The other complications that, that end up being treated by interventional endoscopists um, is called bile duct stones. So these stones, if small enough, can actually pop into the bile duct and then get stuck in the bile duct itself. When that happens, it causes an obstruction of the bile, so the bile can't, um, can no longer drain, and um, you can get yellowing of your eyes, darkening of the urine, um, pain, uh, as well as fever. Um, sometimes that can sort of produce an infection that's also dangerous. And for that, um, the treatment is called an ERCP procedure that we do through the mouth um, and to make a small incision at the bottom of the bile duct to extract that stone. So you put the endoscope through their mouth? That's down right. Into them? Yeah, so I can sort of, sort of show you in this picture. Um, we use a special kind of scope um, that goes through the mouth, through the stomach, into the intestines, and your gallbladder attaches somewhere here in the second portion of the small bowel, um, and that's pictured sort of back here again. Okay. And so our scope sits here, and we are able to sort of see uh, the opening of the bile duct, and we use x-ray uh, to see where the stone is, and then enter and use instruments to remove that stone after we make a small incision at the So at the, the endoscope that you put in there has a little camera on it? That's is right. That right. Yep, it does. Is it the same? Do you put a second one in or something to, like, grab or remove? So we have, the, yeah. So yeah how does that work? <laughs> yeah, so we have... Um, a couple of channels um, uh, in the endoscope where we can insert instruments, and that allows us to do, so they're very 
uh, sort of miniature instruments that allows us to work in a very small space. And it's all happening through the scope itself. Mm -hmm. And this is called minimally invasive? Is That's that right, correct? it's minimally, minimally invasive. Explain a little bit about what that means. That's sure. the difference between... Yes, so, so um, you know, many years ago, probably in, before the 1970s, if there was a stone stuck in the bile duct, um, a surgeon, while they're removing the gallbladder, would have to then do exploration of the bile duct, which surgically can be very technically challenging because it's a very small um, organ to access and complication rates can be very high. And it sits underneath your liver, right? That's, so that's exactly right. a little hard right. to get to it. That's exactly <laughs> right. Access point can be, and it also um, goes through the pancreas. Um, and so it can be um, sort of an ordeal. Uh, and after this procedure got um, invented, um, it really changed um, gallbladder disease in terms of bile duct stones and the treatment of bile duct stones. So when you're doing this, um, do you have to like, are there holes that you poke into them, or how, how does that, you know? Yeah. So, what kind of scarring are they left with that? Yes. <laughs> that's my question. So that's the benefit of any interventional endoscopy, um, and also general um, gastroenterology um, procedures, is that we do everything either through the mouth or through the anus, so only through natural orifices. Okay. There's no external is, ex, um, incisions on the outside, nice. and um, that promotes very quick recovery and very short hospital stays. Right rather than, you know, having to get stitches and all of that. that that's that right, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. And just to be clear, we're, we're talking about um, the particular complication of a stone going into the bile duct. Okay. Um, now, the ultimate treatment for the gallbladder is going to be removal of the gallbladder, um, and that's, like I said, done by a general surgeon, and usually they use laparoscopic techniques where they use small incisions um, from the outside to remove the gallbladder ultimately. Okay. And now you said there were three complications? Yes, very okay, good. Thank you. One. Thank you for reminding me. So the third one is when um, in a very particular situation where a stone might get stuck all the way at the bottom of the bile duct. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can see in this picture, the bile duct actually joins the uh, duct or the tube in the pancreas called a pancreatic duct. And so when that stone gets blocked down there, it actually blocks um, pancreatic enzyme secretion from the pancreas. Um, and when that gets blocked as well, the pancreas can get very inflamed and you can get acute pancreatitis. Mm. So in the situation where you have acute pancreatitis from gallstone disease, we need to do an ERCP within 24 hours usually of when you arrive to the hospital to remove that bottom stone. We've been interrupted. Sure. You know, I don't know why. Sorry for the interruption. We lost our signal there. We're resuming our interview here with Dr. Nazia Hassan um, on our hashtag our doc talk. Sometimes that happens. And I'm sorry, we got interrupted when you were describing the third kind of um, problem that you'll complication that sure. you'll see. Yeah, so, if so you let's want go to back to resume so, that. Sorry yes, about of course, that. Not at all. Um, and so the third complication that can happen is when a stone gets stuck right at the bottom of the bile duct in a particular location where it also meets the duct or the tube that's in the pancreas, the pancreatic duct. Um, and that stone being stuck in the bile duct also then blocks the pancreas from being able to secrete um, its enzymes. And that can cause inflammation of the pancreas. And we call that acute pancreatitis. And if that were to occur um, and there's a stone, there's evidence of a stone that's still there blocking the duct, um, we would need to do an ERCP to remove that stone um, so the pancreas can begin to heal and then eventually have gallbladder removal as well. Okay. And again, sorry for the interruption there. We just lost our signal, had to restart, but that's okay. Um, let's move on to some of the other things that you treat unless we, there's something else to know about gallstones. Or gallstone sure, diseases. I guess um, the only other things I wanted to say about um, gallstone diseases is, is that it's very common, more than a million people get diagnosed with gallstones every year. Wow. Um, so if you have symptoms, you shouldn't ignore them. Once you start developing symptoms, it's likely that they will recur um, and the gallstones don't really go away by themselves. They really need some sort of treatment. So it's not necessary that, that a surgery always be done. Um, there are other options, including a bile acid pill. Um, that's for particular patients who are not good surgical candidates and have very small stones. It might help dissolve those stones using a medicine. Um, but the majority of people will need surgery uh, to ultimately and definitively get rid of the stones and to prevent all the complications that we see spoke about. Okay. And if you had a piece of advice, is there something we can do 
to keep our gallstones healthy? Is it diet important? Or? Yeah. Um, so once you develop gallstones, um, they're, all you can do is sort of prevent further gallstones from forming. And the best way to do that is to have a low fat diet and exercise at least three times a day of moderate 30, minute ex 30 to 45 minutes of exercise. Um, to prevent more gallstones from forming. Unfortunately, once you have gallstones and once you become symptomatic, um, there isn't a whole lot we can do to reverse that, but we can um, certainly do things to not uh, make it worse. Okay. So one of the other things that you said you kind of treat a lot is reflux disease. Please explain what sure. is reflux disease. Yeah. Disease. So reflux um, is again another very one of the most common things that we see in a general GI office. And then from the interventional endoscopy standpoint, complications of reflux is a very common thing that we treat. Um, so to understand reflux disease, we sort of have to go back to the upper GI anatomy to understand what's going on. So some amount of reflux is normal in our physiology, um, and we really call it reflux disease or gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, um, when there's evidence that you're having a lot of symptoms and there's um, damage being done. So, so go back to the upper GI anatomy, this is our esophagus, so um, the esophagus is a long muscular tube that carries food down into the stomach. At the bottom of the esophagus is a circular ring of muscle called the lower esophageal sphincter. And the sphincter, um, when we take a bite of something, it relaxes, allows food to go down into the stomach, and then it should close back up again to protect us from that food to not go back up into um, the esophagus and, re and reflux. Um, there are certain things that can happen, um, including anatomy, our diet, and our lifestyle, um, that either weakens our lower esophageal sphincter, or our stomach can be really big and there can be pressure to push food back up. Um, so the reflux is happening really at the bottom of your esophagus, but it can present with many sorts of things. The most common thing is heartburn, so very typical sort of burning sensation in our chest that can go all the way up to our throat. But you can also have atypical symptoms of reflux, like a chronic cough um, or chest pain and things like that. Um, so that's basically reflux disease. And we call it disease when we see that there's evidence of inflammation at the bottom of the esophagus because of the high acid content and the frequency of the reflux. What's causing it? What's causing it to come back up? Sure, so, um, so a couple of things. So one is the weakening of the lower esophageal sphincter. That may happen just with age. Certain foods actually relax the lower esophageal sphincter as well mm -hmm. and increase the amount of acid that we have in the stomach. So it's a, the, the contents that are coming up end up being more acidic. So um, those typical foods tend to be um, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, so, um, all, all the good stuff. All no, the I'm good kidding. stuff. Yeah, <laughs> tomato-based pro you know, pasta, pasta and red wine is probably the worst combination. Yeah. <laughs> um, all the red sauces, so tomato-based sauces, um, tomatoes in general, citrus foods, peppermint, spicy foods. Those can all increase the amount of acid in our stomach and also um, weaken that lower esophageal sphincter. Mm -hmm. There's also um, another thing that can happen that's very common, um, and that's called a hiatal hernia. Um, the esophagus, right where it meets the stomach, usually goes through an opening in the diaphragm, a muscle that sits right underneath our lungs. And that opening can also weaken with time. And if it does, a, a portion of the stomach can come up into the esophagus, and that can make reflux really common. And sometimes when hiatal hernias are very large and people are not responding to medications, um, they'll need surgical repair. But you could have a high little hernia and not even know it, right? I That's mean, absolutely that, yeah. right. Most people do not know that they have any sort of high little hernia um, whatsoever, and it might just show up on an endoscopy. Okay. And so how do you know if what you're having is, you called it GERD? Is that yeah. right? How do you know it's GERD and not just... Uh, I ate too much for dinner. Right yeah, now. <laughs> good. So that sort of um, uh, suggests the question of um, also when do you seek help? Right. When is it a, a normal physiologic um, thing and when do you need to, to get help? So I would say if you, um, there are a couple of things. If you have very typical reflux symptoms and over-the-counter medications are controlling your reflux or you make some diet and lifestyle changes and it completely controls your reflux, um, you don't necessarily need to seek medical attention unless your reflux is 
occurring for the first time later on in your life. So if you're over the age of 50 and all of a sudden you're having new reflux, that could be a sign that you need to see a doctor. Um, and also if you're having some troublesome symptoms, so if you're having difficulty swallowing food, if you're vomiting, certainly, um, if you have black stools, suggestive of bleeding, um, all those things should prompt a medical evaluation. Okay. Um, how is it treated? Do you, do you have to do surgery or are there medications that can help? So, and, and what do you think of over-the-counter, like things like Tums? And yeah, that yeah. Stuff? Well, that's a good question. So um, so I guess let's, to, to understand how we treat it, let's talk about how we diagnose it first. So just the symptoms it themselves and the response to the medications will allow a doctor to diagnose you with GERD. Um, you don't necessarily need anything beyond that. Um, but like I said, if you have alarm symptoms or um, if you're above the age of 50 with new reflux, then it may be time to get um, a, a gastrointestinal evaluation. And what we would do is maybe do an upper endoscopy, flexible tube with the camera through the mouth, again, to focus and take a look at the bottom of the esophagus to make sure that there's no signs of, of chronic damage going on. Um, and also to rule out some complications of reflux. Um, uh, and those would be ulcerations or narrowing or stricturi stricturing, um, and also a precancerous condition called Barrett's. Um, mm -hmm. And Barrett's is a concern because it can lead to esophageal cancer. Um, and so we can identify all of those um, factors on an endoscopy, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean everyone needs an endoscopy. Okay. Um, so the way that you would treat it um, is um, really dependent on how mild, moderate, or severe your symptoms are. So if you have very mild symptoms, changes in your diet and lifestyle can do a lot uh, in terms of treatment without the need for medication. So um, considering the anatomy that we just reviewed, um, a lot of patients, if they just reduce the amount of intake they're having and eat smaller, more frequent meals, as opposed to large meals just once or twice a day, where the stomach gets very distended and can push up that food, um, that can help. Also avoiding late night meals um, and putting in at least three hours between your bedtime and, uh, and your dinner uh, can be helpful. At nighttime, you can also put wedges or sleep on a couple of pillows to just make sure you're um, elevated a, a bit, and that's enough uh, sort of um, anatomic changes to avoid reflux from happening. Um, if you have mild symptoms, you can also try over-the-counter antacids um, like Tums or Maalox or Mylanta. Um, I would just warn against using too much of those things. Um, they contain components uh, like aluminum, magnesium, calcium, and so in large amounts, um, they can become problematic in terms of kidney problems and fluid issues and electrolyte issues. Um, but every now and then for mild symptoms, if they're being resolved with over-the-counter and acids, that's okay to use. Um, and now if you have mild to moderate symptoms, if you're having symptoms more than two, two or three times a week, um, that's where we really think you probably have GERD, um, actual disease that's not gonna get better without medications. And there's a couple medications that we use. If you have severe symptoms, we sort of just go to the big guns. For us, that's called PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. Um, and there are several on the market and you can get some of them over the counter and some doses and you can get others prescription. Um, and PPIs are relatively safe. They're one of the most prescribed medications in the US, um, but they've gotten a lot of bad press um, recently because of the sort of associations with um, certain risks. Um, and so there are certain risks that you have to be aware of, um, but we can sort of avoid those complications from happening if we can minimize the dose that you're taking and limit the amount of time that you're taking them. And then the middle class of medications is called histamine antagonists. So th these might be medications like Tagamet or Pepsid. Um, they're, they're a little bit less potent than the PPIs, um, but their safety profile is a little bit improved, um, and so they can be taken safely long term. So talk to your doctor about what the exact right regimen is for you if you're having difficulty in controlling your symptoms um, with these medications. Okay, great. Um, we are coming towards the end here, but <clears throat> before we go, I, I want to ask the one question I, I like. How often do we get a doctor to sit down and tell us? If you had one basic health tip for people to keep that intestinal and digestive tract healthy, what would you tell them? Okay. I have more than one, unfortunately. So <laughs> I would say there's two major things. One is um, if you're smoking, um, quit smoking. 
um, that affects every single system in our entire body. Um, we hear about it in lung cancer a lot, but um, it actually is a, a huge um, component of heart disease, of a lot of the GI issues that we have. Um, and so that's one, um, that's, a, that's a very easy one that I can say it has the most impact in terms of your health. Um, no matter what else you're doing, if you're still smoking, it's gonna sort of counteract all the good things. Um, the second thing from the GI standpoint would be fiber. Um, the daily recommended fiber intake is 25 to 35 grams per day. Um, Americans get really less than half of that um, on a daily basis, and so it's really important to consider a fiber supplementation if you are not getting enough fiber. And the best way to do that is to use powdered fiber, and that can prevent a lot of things in terms of diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, even colon polyps. It also has benefits for heart as well as cholesterol. Okay. Yeah. Great. This has been very interesting and informative, and thank you, Dr. Hassan, for being here. Thank you for those of you who tuned in. This post, as well as the first half, which got interrupted, are both on North Bay's Facebook page at facebook.com slash North Bay Healthcare. I will also combine them and put them on North Bay's YouTube site, so you can find that in the next few days or so. Thank you, and join us next time on Hashtag Our Doc Talk. Thank you.